Uh, I am moderator of the session. My name is Eva Holmerova, and currently I have the honor to, to uh, chair Alzheimer, Alzheimer Europe. I am from the Czech Republic and from also from the Czech Alzheimer Society and, and Center of Ex Expertise and Longevity and Long-Term Care. So our first speaker is Laura O. Philbin from Ireland, and she will give her as her presentation, one year of caring and coping with dementia in COVID-19 times. So uh, welcome Laura and the floor, the virtual floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, good, or good afternoon, I should say. My name is Laura O'Philbin and I am the Interim Research and Policy Manager at the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. So um, the first thing to say, I guess, is this report, um, Caring and Coping with Dementia and COVID-19, was a whole team approach. And I don't mean just the research team. We had our colleagues in advocacy and communication support us with this. And we also had some fantastic PPI contributors, Kevin Quaid, Dahi C, Helena Quaid, Tony McIntyre and Sean Mackle, for whom we're very grateful for their support. So back in April 2020, which seems like a really long time ago now, we asked people living with dementia and their family carers how they felt as lockdown began. And they were anxious, fearful, stressed, concerned that their world was shrinking and worried that they would be left behind. And then when we asked participants how they felt that we, the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland, could support them, people mentioned social calls, stimulating activities, advice and respite, because all of our services were closed at the time. So the results of this work were presented to our committee and alternate supports who were developing remote and online services um, in order to replace those face-to-face -face services which had been closed. So this actually meant that the research fed directly into practice, which was really nice for us. Um, these supports focused on, so, focused on socialising, stimulation, advice, respite, just as people had said that they wanted. Then, three months later, in July 2020, we went back to those people with dementia and their families and we asked about their experience of the pandemic. And actually it made for really difficult reading and really difficult listening. Their fears had been realised, they were isolated, stressed, anxious, helpless and angry, and their mental health had taken a huge, huge toll. And then 12 months after services closed, this report that I'm speaking about today focused on how are people living with dementia and their families doing now, 12 months into the, the global pandemic. So this work represents the third report in our series. And as you can see, we used a couple of different methods of, of data collection. Um, and we actually had a huge survey response. Um, I don't know about you, but when I'm filling out a survey, I get a bit bored. I, I don't write too much. I just fill in the, the essentials and that's it. But when people were applying to these surveys, they were writing long paragraphs and passages. They just really wanted their voices to be heard. They needed to be heard. And that's what we really felt. And they wrote such deep and um, things that, that had been happening to them that was it just really showed us, I suppose, how how much they had been struggling. So 17 people with dementia took part in our, in our sample and 240 family carers. And obviously a big area for improvement for us is the sample size of people living with dementia. So for the people with dementia, we kind of asked them, you know, what, what are the really hard parts about COVID-19? What's, what, what's happening for you? So they had a lack of routine, um, struggling with activities for daily living. Um, and, and all of these kind of points I'm going to bring, they're all interconnected. So one person here says, the worst part for me is being alone and not having help to sort out little things like the TV or a lack of normality. They can't meet up with their friends. We'll see here people feeling down and sad. Some person said, I would be dead without my dog. He is great company. I get very down in the dumps at times when you're not going out and mixing, it's really hard. Um, I can't meet my friends, I can't go to the beach, I'm tied to the house, it's cruel. Um, people felt like nobody cared about them, their, their mental health was just in a, in a really, really bad way. And we kind of asked them what sort of supports do they need, you know, a year on, what, what is it that they need? And so many people just wanted somebody to talk to, somebody to be coming to the house, whether it be home care or home health services to reopen just to get back to some type of normality where they could see people and and begin to to interact again and um, one positive was that there are respondents with dementia do feel very supported by their family and friends i think it was 93 percent and by health and social care professionals they felt very supported too but 
but they missed the interaction and that they they became very lonely during this time a lot of our respondents did and um, when we asked family carers what they felt and when we asked our dementia advisors and our frontline staff they could see social withdrawal and apathy and um, there was an issue with cancelling healthcare appointments and um, for people with dementia they've increased confusion due to the lack of routine and restrictions it was hard to understand for a lot of people and also we can't go without mentioning the incredibly challenging hospital and nursing home environments for people with dementia their families and also for the staff working in those environments too and what was really interesting is there was a very small number of people with, living with dementia who kind of said that the that COVID-19 didn't really have much of an impact on them that they they kind of felt okay about it and this was even though this was a really small number um, we then could see that the the person their their loved one or their family care whoever it was was kind of absorbing a lot of the stress for them and that person wasn't being confronted with situations or people they weren't familiar with their their life became more straightforward um, but they had a huge amount of support from their family member and that was the key difference so 81% of um, family caregivers feel concerned about a decline in their loved one with dementia. And this was a decline in their symptoms of dementia, but also in their mental health too. So for family members, when we think about their mental health, we see grief, loss, stress, worry, constant anxiety as to what happens to my loved one if I fall ill or if he got ill or deteriorated. Um, Another person said, I feel complete isolation and worry constantly about keeping my mother safe. I feel exhausted. She's always on my mind. I worry constantly. You see that there seems to be no reprieve and no respite without services. There was just nothing for people to, there's nowhere for people to turn. A lot of people felt very abandoned. People had guilt and frustration because a lot of people who were in a caring role were also caring for children or for other family members. They were working, they were had many other things to attend to, and they just really struggled making that balance. So one person said, I'm constantly worried about both my parents, and I feel whenever I'm not with them, I'm letting them down. So it makes for a very difficult reading. And 28% of family carers um, are considering or have considered moving um, for the person with dementia uh, to long-term care over the past year. And 65% of these say the move is sooner than expected due to COVID-19. When we asked family carers and people with dementia to list their greatest challenges, these were the ones that came out. It's not a, a randomized control trial or anything, but these are the words that were the most common. And it's largely reflective of the findings of those reports that we did back in March and back in July in 2020. People were having the same challenges, anxiety, lonely, lack of break um, routine pressure isolation support like there was just so many challenges for people but um and these they, they nothing was really helping which which was which is very difficult and i think it's important to note that covid 19 isn't the sole cause of this crisis it has actually just illuminated the sparse and scarce nature of dementia service provision no county in Ireland has an adequate number of supports and services and this was long before COVID-19 reached our shores and um, you know we in the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland we tried to adapt to the pandemic we provided some some in-home and some remote services to people but well they, they were good for some people but they could not go to to adequately address the desperate need for face-to-face -face stimulation or respite when you think there's 64,000 people living with dementia in Ireland and 63% of these live at home. And I think this report sheds light on the valuable and courageous role played by family carers and people with dementia who cocooned when they were asked to and they made huge sacrifices, but now they're facing this mental health and physical health crisis due to doing this. So, I did want to just present these kind of hard hitting and upsetting results because it, it was hard hitting and I know that we were all and um, those of us who took part in the results we were all a bit I suppose shocked and upset like we, we knew that things were bad but it was reading people's um, experiences was, was very tough and understanding what they were going through so we have to then decide what what are we going to do about this what's going to happen now so within the report we made some recommendations um, and these were, you know, reopening of face-to-face -face services and supports, urgent care support, 
more person-centered services, um, particularly aimed at those in the later stages of dementia, home care with attention on social needs to try and alleviate that loneliness, and also investment and planning in dementia services is really urgent and needs to be prioritized. And just to go back there to the urgent care support, family members have been deeply impacted by the demands of caring and their physical and mental health has suffered. So this kind of support is really, like now we need to go and provide those kind of support packages to them. So we launched the report on the 11th of June in 2021, and there was messaging and PR and social media, and we invited people to tell their stories. And you'll see in this image here, this is a, a member of our Dementia Care Campaign Network, Ashling Harmon and her mom, Carmel. And they told their story of, of how the, the pandemic was making them feel. Uh, one of our highlights is that we appeared on um, our national news in Ireland, um, RTE News, um, to try and I suppose just shed light on what's happening and there's so much noise around COVID we just needed to try and cut through the noise and just make sure that people could hear us. We ran a dementia awareness and information session for interested politicians and we were just kind of got the word out there over a long period of time and every year the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland does the pre-budget submission and that's where we lobby the government to include funding for dementia in the following year's budget and this presentation is not about our pre-budget submission so I won't go into detail on that but what we did ask was things that came from this report so we needed investment in day services we need urgent care support so you'll see here 2.3 million we asked for for family care support packages um, and this would comprise support groups, training programs and professional counselling services. We asked for home care supports, which was so greatly missed throughout the pandemic. And while the budget results still aren't 100% clear because they bring out another service plan next year, um, home care hours have been ring fenced for dementia have actually doubled from 5% in 2021 to 11% in 2022. So that's really good news, but we still need to be able to focus in on how do we support people who are having challenges with their mental health and how do we get all of our day services back open um, as many of them um, aren't really suitable premises anymore due to COVID so, so we do urgently need investment in that and I think look we'll all feel the effects of this pandemic for a really long time but investment services support and action are really needed to support people living with dementia and their families and we've used this report to raise the alarm and we'll continue to fight for supports and services but you know for, particularly for for people with dementia and their families like mental health their mental health wasn't already prioritized even before COVID-19 and now it's made so much worse and we need to do something about it so we're continuing to use our report to use the resources we have and um, but this report was basically just used to shine a light on what's happening what the mental health crisis is here in Ireland and hopefully use it to go ahead and secure some funding so time will tell and that's everything from me so thank you so much for listening if anyone does have any questions you can always contact me and there's more information on www.alzheimer.ie that's great thank you very much Thank you very much, Laura, for your very nice and illustrative presentation. And, and we are sure that there will be some questions, but we agreed to put this section in the end of our whole section. So if you kindly can wait with us. And I would like to introduce, um, in the meantime, our next speaker, who is Els Bakker. Uh, Els is a PhD student and neuropsychologist for the Alzheimer's Center Amsterdam, Amsterdam, University Medical Center. She is working on the Polar Project, Psychosocial Effects of Corona in Alzheimer's Disease. In this project, they investigate the consequences of COVID-19 times in people with dementia and their caregivers. Their, uh, the aim of the project is to create a resilient and dementia-friendly society during and after COVID-19 times. So the floor is yours, Els. Thank you for joining my presentation. My name is Els Bakker, and in the upcoming minutes, I will talk about the psychosocial effects of COVID-19 measures on people with dementia and pre-dementia during the second lockdown. These are the disclosures of the Alzheimer's Center Amsterdam. I have nothing to disclose. The COVID-19 pandemic poses enormous social challenges, especially during lockdown when social distancing is imposed. Older people are particularly at risk of the consequences of COVID-19. They have direct risk of severe COVID-19 symptoms 
and they are at risk of social isolation as they are more likely to live alone and less often use online communication tools. Moreover, people with cognitive decline in dementia and their caregivers are affected by disrupted support services. For example, daycares were closed, home care was reduced, and voluntary support was often stopped. In December 2020, the second wave of COVID-19 reached the Netherlands and the government issued a second lockdown. The second lockdown was more strict than the first, as restrictions on social contact and reduced access to services were more severe. Non-essential stores were closed, indoor sports centers were closed, all cultural events were closed, restaurants were closed. The number of visitors at home was reduced to one visitor a day and a curfew was imposed for three months. The informal support network of children, neighbors and volunteers was still largely ineffective as a result of the measures on social contacts. Previous studies conducted uh, during the first lockdown in 2020 report more cognitive decline, worsened neuropsychiatric symptoms and increased caregiver burden. In addition, uh, we did uh, in a previous study a survey um, in the first lockdown and we saw that these changes were found in people with dementia, but also in people with mild cognitive impairment and subjective cognitive decline. With the onset of the second lockdown, we aim to investigate experience support, worries for foster cognitive decline, psychosocial and behavioral effects in people with dementia and pre-dementia and caregivers during the second lockdown. We deliberately focused on postal uh, positive aspects such as uh, experience support and activities that help the most to endure lockdown. In addition, we compared responses between first and second lockdown. Between December 2020 and March 2021, we invited memory clinic patients and caregivers to complete a self-designed COVID-19 survey. Patients were recru recruited if they were actively enrolled in ongoing sub-studies of the Amsterdam Dementia cohort. We included people with different diagnoses, so people with different types of dementia, MCI and SCD, and in total 532 uh, people were uh, included. Loved ones and caregivers of these patients were invited to complete a similar COVID-19 survey with additional questions on caregiver burden. In total, 366 caregivers uh, participated. There were 205 patient caregiver diets. Uh, this means that there are 205 pairs of patients and corresponding caregivers. To extend our findings with reports of caregivers of patients in a more severe disease stage and foster generalizability across the Netherlands, we additionally recruit caregivers via Alzheimer Nederland, which is a Dutch association for people living with dementia. 460 caregivers completed the survey via Alzheimer Nederland. A subset of patients and caregivers of the Amsterdam Dementia Cohort completed a similar survey on psychosocial effects of COVID-19 measures during the first lockdown in the Netherlands, three to six months earlier. The online survey contained questions on life during the second lockdown with questions regarding different aspects of daily life and experienced feelings. Questions regarding COVID-19 infection consisted of questions on being infected with COVID-19 and worries for a possible COVID-19 infection. With regard to the psychosocial and behavioral effects, questions were included on loneliness, anxiety, uncertainty, depression, apathy, change in sleeping behavior, fatigue, stress, and patient's behavior. And for example, we asked them, are you feeling more lonely? Regarding worries for faster cognitive decline, we ask patients whether they were worried for getting more memory problems. And we ask caregivers whether they were worried for the loved one getting more memory problems. And with regard to the experienced support, um, we included questions on support from the GP, home care, daycare, case manager, volunteers, neighbors, friends and family, sports, music and hobbies. And finally, questions regarding continuation and discontinuation of care consisted of daycare and digital or physical health care appointments.
To promote an inclusive approach, the survey was tested and adapted by FADOS and the ABC Foundation, uh, which are committed to reducing health inequalities. So we could ensure the language used was appropriate for at least B1 proficiency. And we used two uh, platforms for the online survey, online ADC, which is developed uh, by the Alzheimer's Center Amsterdam, and MWM2, which is often used by Alzheimer's Nederland. And we use these platforms um, to email participants with a digital link to the online survey, and we used the platforms for data collection. Well, the descriptive statistics were used to report on frequencies, so the numbers and the, uh, the percentages, and differences in the frequencies between first and second lockdown were compared using a generalized estimation equation analysis. These are the baseline characteristics of the subjects. And we see that people with MCI or dementia or dementia were slightly older than people with SCD. And in addition, caregivers of Alzheimer Nederland took more frequently care of people in a dementia stage than caregivers of the Amsterdam dementia cohort. In figure one, you see the reported psychosocial effects, loneliness, anxiety, uncertainty, depression, stress, fatigue, and feeling good. In dark blue, you see people with SED. In light blue, you see people with MCI or dementia. In dark orange, you see caregivers of the Amsterdam dementia cohort. And in light orange, caregivers of Alzheimer Nederland. In on visual inspection, we see that psychosocial effects were most often reported by caregivers especially caregivers of the uh, Alzheimer Nederland. In addition, we also asked caregivers what they saw, uh, whether they saw an increase in behavioral symptoms in the patients, and highest frequencies uh, for patient behavioral symptoms were reported by caregivers of Alzheimer Nederland again. And uh, we also asked patients themselves about uh, behavioral symptoms, uh, and a small group of patients reported an increase in apathy and change in sleeping behavior. In figure two, you see the reported experience support. When we ask respondents what helped them cope with COVID-19 times, the majority of respondents reported friends and family, practice and hobbies, and playing or listening to music helped them cope. And also neighbors and practicing sports were frequently mentioned. Over 25% of caregivers reported to feel extensively burdened with giving care uh, during lockdown. However, over 75% of caregivers reported getting enough help uh, in caregiving. A subgroup of people with MCI, dementia, uh, and caregivers reported that daycare for patients continued. Well, we compared self-reported psychosocial and behavioral impacts of the lockdown and experience support between first and second lockdown. Um, uh, and we observe a consistent decline in the frequency of reported psychosocial and behavioral effects compared to the first lockdown by both patients and caregivers. By contrast, uh, the proportion of patients that feared the COVID-19 infection increased. This increase was also observed on the caregiver level with regards to fear for the patient getting infected. Patients reported to have experienced more formal and informal support during the first, uh, compared to the first lockdown. And in conclusion, uh, people with dementia, MCI or SED and caregivers and society in general may have adapted to the new normal of the COVID-19 times. Formal and informal support systems seem better organized and we identified ways to boost resilience in patients and caregivers. Further directions would be to develop tools and recommendations that focus on increasing resilience to COVID-19 challenges in uh, cognitively impaired individuals and their caregivers. We already developed tools for caregivers, the healthcare professionals and volunteers. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Caroline Smith, has told more about this in her presentation yesterday, which you can still view online, I think. And we will also want to spread our knowledge on how to deal with the COVID-19 times uh, to government agencies. And the government already used our previous study uh, for their fact sheets and for their policy. So that, which is really nice. 
thank you for your attention and please let me know if there are any questions. Thank you very much, Els, for your very interesting presentation, for staying with us. Yes, and may I ask you to stay until the end of this session to discuss, because I'm sure that your presentation was really interesting and there will be really some questions. So, and our next speaker is, uh, or are, Diane Cove and Anna Diaz. The presenting uh, author will be uh, Diane, if I am right. Uh, and I would like to uh, just uh, uh, say that in the presentation, Diane Gove, Director for Projects at Alzheimer Europe, will present a few um, short speeches which uh, she and her colleague Anna Diaz put together about the experiences of the European Working Group in public involvement during uh, uh, the pandemic. This includes presentations by three members of the European Working Group of People with Dementia, uh, Bent Heise, who is vice chair of the group, Angela Potoshnik and Petri Lampinen, supported by Johanna Piringer and Nina Lampinen, as well as Jani Algren, who supports her father, Stefan Eriksson, who is also a member of the European Working Group of Persons with Dementia. So the floor is yours to organize this part of our meeting, Diane. Good afternoon. I'm Diane Gove, Director for Projects at Alzheimer Europe. Alzheimer Europe is keen to promote the involvement of people with, with dementia in research as research participants, but also in the context of public involvement, providing the perspectives and experiences of people with dementia in relation to the research topic, the methodology and various issues throughout the whole research process. In 2012, Alzheimer Europe set up the European Working Group of People with Dementia which is currently composed of 14 men and women with different types of dementia and from different countries. And since 2012, the group has participated in several European projects in the context of public involvement. And to do their work, the members of the European Working Group of People with Dementia normally meet three to four times a year face-to-face -face in Brussels over a two-day period. And this provides them with the time and space to discuss topics in depth and, and to create within a safe environment a good working relationship with the researchers. We had the last of these meetings in February 2019, just before the pandemic really started to take hold. And due to the pandemic and the associated social distancing, it was no longer possible or safe to meet face to face. And at that time, we didn't have any prior experience in organizing and moderating online meetings with people with dementia. The group resumed its activities online very early on, and this has been very positive. The group has achieved a lot and have contributed to several research projects since then. But this did not come without any challenges and struggles, and we're very proud of the work and efforts of the group and the people who support them. And we developed last year a report about how to make events more inclusive, and this also covered the topic of online meetings like Zoom meetings. We have here with us today four members of the European Working Group of People with Dementia, Angela, Bent, Petri and Stefan, and three of their supporters, Johanna, Nina and Jani. And we've asked them to describe from their own perspective the challenges that they've encountered and how they've overcome them. And in the speeches, Johanna and Nina are supporting Angela and Petri by reading out parts of their speeches. And Jani, Stefan's daughter, will speak from her own perspectives about her experience of supporting her father. Thank you. When the first Zoom events were offered with the COVID-19 lockdown in spring 2020, I was surprised what, at what we people with cognitive impairments were being asked to do. This was also new for the organizers. They had no experience in moderating safe and appropriate online meetings for people with dementia. Therefore, Joanna and I developed some recommendations, which were welcomed by many people, including the platform of the Austrian Dementia Strategy. When the first Zoom meeting of the working group started, I had just learned to connect and to enter a meeting without help, providing, 
the technology works, but I was quickly swamped. Many visual and acoustic impressions overwhelmed me. It was noisy. People talked at the same time and in English, which is not my native language. The images of the participants on my screen were tiny. I didn't know who was speaking and how to make myself heard when I wanted to speak. It was difficult to keep my concentration. It was all exciting and exhausting for me. And soon I realized I couldn't attend uh, meetings longer than 45 minutes. Online meetings are at least twice excess and exhausting than face-to-face -face meetings. I think for all of us, the first meetings were an experiment. Also for Anna and Diane, who support our group, it was important that they requested our feedback, listened to what was difficult for us and responded to our needs in the subsequent Zoom meeting. The group was divided in smaller subgroups and we agreed on rules uh, for speaking. Over time, I learned to turn my camera and my microphone off and on again. It was very important that meetings now last a maximum of one and a half hours and have a break. As we are vaccinated, Joanna and I sit together on the computer, which makes the communication easier and translation and support can take place immediately. Thank you, Anna and Diane, for campaigning the working group in such a professional and sensitive way. For more than one and a half years, we live with the COVID-19 pandemic all over the world. During that time, our life that we knew has severely changed. Many of our habits and self-evident behavior had to be changed or had to be substituted. That's a problem for everybody, but that's even more a problem for people with dementia. It is a challenge to adapt to the new rules and restrictions, and they sometimes must be updated according to the course of the pandemic and to the increasing knowledge about the virus. These variations can be challenging for people with dementia. In addition, our meetings have changed. Before the pandemic, we have met up to five times a year, including the annual Alzheimer Congress. That helped us to get to know everybody much better and it helped to learn from each other. The pandemic has changed a lot. Meetings became virtual. The way to communicate has changed to be based on a set of online tools. That means also that a good deal of our nonverbal communication may be lost in the meetings. That can also be a barrier and a challenge for people with dementia when they are non-native speakers like me. Also, it can be challenging to use different type of communication systems at the at a time like email, WhatsApp, and Zoom. Each are based on different access methods. We must ensure that people with dementia can participate at the meetings without barriers. I still see a glimmer of hope that in the next future, we will have face-to-face -face meetings again. Hello, I am Petri Lampinen from Finland. It has been a tough year, but despite everything, I can smile. My mother got sick two years ago, and this summer she passed away. I took care of her and my father's business during the illness. As a former cemetery gardener, I also took care of everything related to the burial. Dementia has not taken away the professionalism learned at work, but the grief came stronger than ever. I have come touchingly close. During the past year, my wife's father also became seriously ill. 
so we had a lot to share with each other. The hug felt good and safe during that time. We continued to support each other. Stop working group activities. I informed Alzheimer's Europe staff of my difficult life situation before my mother died. I asked them for a break from the working group meetings. They gave me good understanding and support. I felt that I could not work in the working group as I used to, so a break was in order. During the pandemic, our family has moved and new good things have come into life. I have found new opportunities for active work, became more well known, and this gives me more opportunities to share experiences of living with dementia. My wife has also found a new job and fortunately has an understanding employer who sometimes gives her time off so she can assist me in the working group meetings. What have I learned during the pandemic? New things to use on computer and applications. The webinars are successful and if the network connections are lost, our young son will take care of the connections. With calmness, courage and positive attitude, I have overcome many obstacles. Life still has some things to give and I'm moving on curiously. Thank you. Jag, har, jag heter Stefan, 55 år från Sverige. And my name is uh, Jani. Mm. I'm Stefan's daughter and supporter. Uh, and since the meetings for the group, the group became digital, we have actually faced a few struggles. Oh. Uh, first of all, we, we don't live together. Yeah. Um, and it takes me about one, an hour to, to go, oh. come here one way. <laughs> oh. And I, I don't have a car, so I need to take a bus and a train to get there. Oh. Um, and the meetings are always during the mm. day, which means I need to take time off from my job. Mm. And my dad needs to leave earlier from his day activities. Mm. Um, and it uh -huh. needs to make it work with the transportation and everything back home. Mm -hmm. And none of my parents uses a computer. And even if they had one, my dad uh, mm -hmm. has problems using technology. So it's a little problematic for us to attend the, dig the digital meetings, uh, especially during daytime. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but we do try to stay positive. All problems comes with a solution, right? So what we have done is that the time I miss from my regular job, I can instead catch up in the evenings. Oh. Uh, and I also try to work from my dad's home mm. so that I save some time and so that we can use my computer. Yeah. Uh, and the staff at the daycare center where mm. my dad is, um, mm. they make sure that my dad gets on an earlier bus um, to get home in time for the meetings. And the best part of all of this is that dad and I get a joint task that we can do together. Oh. Uh, and in the end, we get some quality time. Oh. Um, so even if the physical meetings were a bit easier and we could focus on just being there um, oh. and not puzzle our lives together, oh. uh, we do see the importance of adapting to what is and to focus on our own mentality oh, towards oh, oh. change and to see the positive aspects of it. Oh. Thank you very much for your presentation. It is not necessary to add anything, but I'm sure that we will discuss it um, later in our, in our um, question and answer section. But I would like to thank very much to Diane and Anne for their fantastic work with the European Working Group of People with Dementia for supporting them and organizing, organizing all events. We really appreciate it. And uh, my big thank, thanks go also to, and especially, especially to members of European Working Group uh, with Dementia and their supporters who shared uh, with us their very, very unique experience. And I think it is the most important thing that we need to hear during our conferences. So thank you very much, everybody. And our next speaker is, um, and it will be also pre-recorded.
no, it will be live. I, I, I see. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We as we agreed in the last minute. So if I may introduce to uh, introduce Lisa Watering, uh, who is a first year PhD student and a neuropsychologist at the Alzheimer's Centrum Amsterdam. Previously, she worked as a research assistant on uh, several European IEMI projects like EPAD, MOPIAD, and Radar AD, which focused on individuals at risk, individuals at risk, or with preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Currently, her focus is on the prevention of cognitive decline. Together with colleagues from five cities in the Netherlands, she is coordinating a multi-domain lifestyle intervention trial. Hence, the interest for lifestyle change during the COVID time. So the floor is yours, Lisa, welcome. Okay, well, thank you for joining my presentation about the impact of COVID-19 restrictions on lifestyle and mental health factors related to brain health in older adults. These are the disclosures of the Alzheimer's Center. I have nothing to disclose. Across the globe, COVID restrictions affect lifestyle and psychosocial factors. In a Dutch study of Van der Werf et al, during the first wave, 12% of participants reported uh, that their lifestyle was more unhealthy compared to before the outbreak. 90% reported that their lifestyle was more healthy compared uh, to the COVID outbreak before. The majority reported no change. This suggests a relatively minor impact of COVID-19 restrictions. However, results on reported, re reported report proportions on lifestyle changes greatly, ver vary greatly across countries. Secondly, this study of Van der Werf et al. was performed only after nine, nine weeks in the first lockdown. It's conceivable that further changes may have taken place, become more persistent or even worsened during the extended time frame of the COVID-19 pandemic. Lifestyle is critically important for brain health. Many lifestyle factors are related to brain diseases like dementia. For example, physical and mental inactivity, unhealthy diet, social isolation, and cardiovascular risk factors have been related to dementia. Recent studies show that 40% of dementia cases are attributable to modifiable factors. The good news is that these lifestyle factors are modifiable. Several studies have shown that improving lifestyle will also improve brain health, also at an older age. One example is the multi-domain lifestyle intervention trial, the FINGER trial, that showed that improving lifestyle could improve or maintain cognitive function for people who are at risk for cognitive decline. They included several interventions like dietary counseling, exercise, cognitive training, and vascular risk monitoring. Since the pandemic has changed the lives of many people across the globe, serious concerns are rising about the impact of COVID-19 restrictions on brain health. Particularly in older adults, changes in lifestyle may affect their risk of developing cognitive decline. Therefore, we want to know what are the effects of the COVID-19 restrictions on brain health related lifestyle factors after one year of the COVID pandemic. We measured both beneficial changes and detrimental changes. Secondly, uh, what are predictors for detrimental and beneficial changes? Um, this will help us to identify individuals who are at risk for future cognitive decline and potential candidates for multi-domain lifestyle interventions. For this cross-sectional online survey, we recruited participants via the Dutch Brain Research Registry, which is an online platform for research volunteers. We included participants between 50 and 99 years old with no self-reported diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment or dementia. The online survey was administered from February till March, which was during the second wave when restrictions were most strict. We selected 12 uh, lifestyle questions related to brain health from two surveys, which, which were uh, combined. The first was the polar survey, which focuses on psychosocial and mental health factors, where the, uh, of which the results were just previously presented by my lovely colleague, Els Bakker. 
And the, seventh, the second survey was provided by Worldwide Fingers Network, which aims to explore how the pandemic has affected lifestyle across many countries. We selected eight factors, experience of loneliness, sleep problems, physical inactivity, unhealthy food intake, alcohol use, smoking, feelings of stress and memory complaints. Participants could indicate if factors increased due to the COVID restrictions, decreased or did not change. For example, for sleep, problem, for sleep problems, we asked participants if they were more often tired during COVID, time, during COVID times or if the COVID-19 um, pandemic affected their sleep problems in daily life. For some factors, we selected only one question and for some factors, we included two or three questions. Results are presented in frequencies, and we used a multinominal logistic regression to identify predictors for detrimental and beneficial change. These are the participants' characteristics. We included 3,943 participants from the Dutch Brain Research Registry. Participants were predominantly female and highly educated. A quarter of participants lived alone and um, one third uh, expressed fear of getting uh, infected with COVID-19. These are the results. This table shows on each risk factor, the percentage of participants that reported detrimental changes in orange, no changes in yellow, and beneficial changes in green. First off, on almost all factor, the majority reported no change. However, when change was reported, this was more often detrimental change with alcohol, see, with uh, alcohol, diet and physical activity being the only exceptions. However, as you can see, the proportions only slightly differ. Loneliness and sleep problems were most often reported detrimental change. For physical activity and diet, almost roughly the same amount of participants reported uh, beneficial changes or detrimental changes. Secondly, we wanted to know if we could identify predictors for detrimental and beneficial changes. So who were the participants that reported multiple detrimental changes and multiple beneficial changes? We did that by composing a multi-domain change score from the eight lifestyle factors. We scored beneficial changes as a positive score and detrimental changes as a negative score. The sum of these factors resulted in, the, in uh, a participant's individual multi-domain change score. So a large positive score uh, indicates mainly uh, beneficial changes and a large negative score uh, indicates uh, mainly detrimental changes. So here you can see the sample distribution. We divided the sample in quartiles. As this study is a population-based study, we use quartile two and three, which is the middle 50% of the sample as a reference group or the norm group. And we labeled them as minimal changes or the average. We were uh, interested in the most extreme changes. So who reported mainly detrimental changes you, here on the left? And uh, who reported mainly beneficial changes, which you can see here on the right. And we compared them, both groups, to the minimal changes. The multinominal logistic regression identified six predictors for mainly detrimental changes. I will only show the significant results here. And the p-value was set at uh, 0 0.05. Participants of younger age, below 65, that were female and lived alone, had higher odds in reporting mainly detrimental changes. Oh. Participants that reported to have more than satisfactory income less often reported detrimental changes. Participants that uh, reported to have a fear of getting a COVID infection had higher odds in reporting mainly detrimental changes. 
most striking result was that participants that, had, that reported to have prior subjective memory complaints and worries had higher odds in reporting mainly detrimental lifestyle changes, which were unfavorable for their brain health. For beneficial change, changes, we only found one association, that living alone decreased the odds of reporting beneficial changes. To summarize the findings, substantial proportion showed changes in lifestyle, which were more often detrimental changes. The, the majority reported no change. Compared to previous study uh, performed by von Werventhal in the Netherlands, unhealthy changes in lifestyle were slightly more often reported, reported suggesting an effect of the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, we showed that negative effects of COVID-19 were related to, sp to specific subgroups, indicating that some individuals seem to be more vulnerable. And participants with subjective, uh, subjective cognitive memory complaints reported more lifestyle changes unfavorable, unfavorable for their brain health. So for individuals with pre-existing risk factors for cognitive decline, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic may increase their risk, their risk for cognitive decline. So the take home message is, maintaining a healthy lifestyle is important to limit the impact of COVID-19 on brain health, especially for specific subgroups that are more vulnerable for the COVID-19 restrictions and future cognitive decline. So take care of yourself, but also keep an eye on the relatives and friends that are more, more vulnerable. Keep each other motivated to maintain or improve a healthy lifestyle. Since personal reactions on each separate lifestyle factors vary greatly, uh, research into uh, personalized multi-domain lifestyle interventions are needed to emphasize and further investigate the relation of lifestyle and brain health. So in light of the Worldwide Fingers Network, uh, Network's aim to replicate and improve, adapt uh, the results of the previous finger trial, a two-year multi-domain lifestyle intervention study, the Finger and L trial, will start coming January. Uh, please visit the quick uh, oral presentation uh, on demand from my colleague Kai Deckers about the design of this study. Thank you for your attention, and I will help, welcome to uh, answer any questions at the end of the session. Thank you very much for your ni nice presentation and look forward to the, uh, the question and answer session. I'm sure that there will be questions. So I can, I think that we can all now put on our microphones and uh, cameras just to meet not in person, but at least virtually. And I would like to ask our moderator if there are some questions on the chat because I, do, I have not seen anything. That I can read the questions for you if you want. Yes, please do. Please yes. do. Uh, there's one that says, um, great to hear from the families and people living with dementia. I think there's a message of hope when you hear the positivity and adaptation made to continue to get the best out of the life. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and feelings. So that's a comment more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The question is, what do you think is the biggest challenge going forward, particularly as we are still going through a pandemic is not over? And I think that was for the first speaker. Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. I think there's going to be such a huge um, burden on mental health services now from, from everyone, not just from people living with dementia and their families. So I think that will be a, a key challenge is how do you find the correct services and supports for people living with dementia and their families when there's so many other people um, requiring access to these services too. So it needs to be ring-fenced or prioritized in some way. Thank you very much. Thanks for the question and for the answer. The, uh, Anna, could you help me further, please? Yes, there's another, there's another question. How do we make sure these services are classed as essential services so that they are not stopped in a pandemic? Mm -hmm. Who would like to answer, please? It is a difficult question, and I think the, the answers are difficult in different different uh, countries. So maybe if, if you all can just very quickly answer. I am Maria Sandias, and I am from Alzheimer's Unity in Rome. 
-hmm. and um, in behalf of uh, Luisa Bartorelli. Uh, I am very much concerned because my husband uh, was uh, infected by Alzheimer, so I know the problem very well. Uh, perhaps I can't uh, answer the question. I can't. I didn't understand it very well. I thank you all for everything, uh, for the news I get from your explanation and your experience. It's very important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It is. It was important remark. Yeah. <laughs> and do we have any other questions? Please? Yes, we have many complimentary um, oh, yeah, comments sure. for everyone. There's a lot of um, um, comments about the very nice presentations and being all kind of keeping working despite the challenges and for the different people. And there's one from members of the European Working Group, Petri and Bern, I think this is for you. What help you most to work online? And what be your advice to other groups of people with dementia? I, uh, well, I have um, uh, a technical background, and uh, with that, I think I could manage a lot of, of all the things. Uh, when I compare it to uh, lot, lots of other people I, I know, I, I know that I have, um, a, well, a better situation, a better uh, starting point uh, to, to start with that. Although I must admit that I still have um, from time to time uh, also my, my problems to, to find the right button uh, to continue at the right time and so on. But well, uh, this is, uh, is, is the case and I have to accept that. But uh, so I'm I'm not in the same uh, knowledge and and so as as before when I uh, did uh, develop a uh, lot of uh, different chips and so on. Thank you, Ben, for your explanation. I think it, it's important that a person has a technical background. Yeah. So does uh, anybody want to? Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, Petri uh, is saying that in during this year uh, he has learned more to use computer, mm -hmm. and and this new computer is is much easier, and uh, for for him uh, he can he can still learn new things, but and we have also our son will help him if if it's needed, and it's a very here. We are not so isolated, so we can. Petri is trying to uh, do or keep all his speeches in by the, the net or to, to keep keep busy during these times. Ja osaan paremmin käyttää työkoneita kuin työelämässä ollessa, että niin kuin on rohkeampi kuin ennen. Yeah, and he said that he's he is more brave to to use the new technology and devices because he was not using it much at the working working time, but he has he has. Uh, learn a lot during this pandemic. Thank you very much for your explanations. And yeah, I think it is important opinion because we all learned that technologies uh, have become a big uh, issue and big help for many people. And yeah, it is so important and so, so positive as well. Yeah, so, uh, so Anna, can you help me further? Because yes. I, I would like to open there's, it. Yeah. Uh, there's also for Lisa. She says there, they sound very interesting in your present your study, Lisa, and they wanted to find out where they can find out more about it. Well, it's currently under review uh, at the co author so I hope to uh, re um, soon submit it somewhere, and then I will um, let it know on my social media where uh, it, it's get, it, it gets published. Okay. So I have to wait a little bit longer. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Just the light, thank you. There are a few more questions, Eva, if you want me to read. Yes, yes if you kind of can. There's a few of them for Ireland. So I think Laura, that's this up for you. One of them is, how do you think carers can be best supported by the Irish government? Is it more care hours slash additional funding? Oh, that's such a good question. And I think lots of different people would say lots of different things. I need to, I think we need to try and personalize. So for some carers, 
they'd love just more home help hours, but for other carers, they might need counselling or they might need an activity to attend with the person living with dementia. So it, it's hard to say what, what the best support is um, without asking carers themselves. But I think um, having a range or a, or a suite of, of different supports would be the, the best option. Thank you. And I can still see, I think that's the final question, Eva. And mm -hmm. you think it's also for about the services that says, despite the pandemic and risk, do you think services should uh, stay open and people can make informed choice to attend? Yeah, I mean, again, that's a, a tough one. Um, personally, um, in my opinion, I guess, um, people are able to make informed decisions and choices, but I can understand why services might need to remain closed and why there's a cautious approach and um, because there's so many people to consider. So it's a it's a tricky question and I imagine every person probably has a really different opinion on it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, for helping me, for your support. Um, as always, we are getting support for our dear staff members of, of Alzheimer Europe, so it's quite proof of it again. And I think our time is, uh, is has been fulfilled by your answers and questions and uh, and I think that it's time to finish our session so I would like to thank you very much it was really very interesting uh, and uh, yeah and very important and I really look forward to, I, and I think uh, that we uh, will be getting more answers also by by emails and so on so thank you all very much and and um, i think that um, we will be able to meet sometime in person because yes it is nice to meet virtually it is important to keep connections also in these difficult times but i hope that it will be um, soon as as soon as possible over and we will be able to meet in person so thank you very very much <laughs>